Europe in the early 20th century was reeling from conflicts between states, empires, and ideologies, which coalesced into two opposing alliances. The Triple Entente, composed of France, Britain, and Russia, and the Triple Alliance of Germany, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and Italy. Years of simmering tensions boiled over when an Austrian noble, the Archduke Franz Ferdinand, was assassinated by Cavallo Princip in the city of Sarajevo. Within months, the fragile peace between the two alliances broke down, and the ties of statesmanship drew the entirety of continental Europe into a brutal conflict in which modern technology was used to devastating effect. June 1918, somewhere at sea. Dearest girl of mine, it seems so strange to be out here in the old Atlantic. Why, it don't seem possible that I should ever be there and under such exciting circumstances. Because, dear, believe me, it is exciting, like some big game of chess with ships at stakes. Here we have Kenneth's first letter, written as he ships out to France. Moving two million men over 3,000 miles of ocean was a mobilization and logistic effort of unprecedented scale. It was quickly apparent that there were not enough military transports to ship the young soldiers, nicknamed doughboys for their age, and civilian ships, including ocean liners and seized German ships, were pressed into service. Kenneth's regiment, the 315th Infantry, crossed on the former German liner SS America. As he writes home to Harriet, his words don't quite reflect the enormity of where he's going and why. America itself came late to the war, first being a neutral supplier of arms and materiel to both sides, but eventually was convinced to join the war by increased German attacks on American shipping lanes supplying weapons to the Entente powers. By 1918, the war had come to a grinding halt amidst the mug trenches of northeastern France. Caught between emplaced fortifications, relentless artillery shelling, and the devastation wrought by the newly developed German gas weapons, the Allies and their enemies both were bogged down. His letter conveys a sense of mixed emotions. Excitement, as he says, like some big game of chess, some longing for home, and the mundane aspects of life at sea. Yet he insists that he's happy and feeling fine. Perhaps the war remains an abstract concept for him, or else there's an unspoken understanding of its seriousness. Regardless, we can certainly surmise an endeavor not to worry Harriet through these letters. August 1st, 1918, France. Dearest Harry, undoubtedly General Pershing is the man of the hour and with the men under his command will throw back those cursed Huns. And believe me, sweetheart, the 315th will do its share. Now that Kenneth's in France, we hear that he's serving as a second lieutenant under the command of General John J. Pershing, leader of the U.S. Army's American Expeditionary Force, or AEF. The French and British, having taken heavy casualties, requested that the American forces be used to plug their dwindling lines. Pershing insisted that the AAF not serve as mere replacement troops for decimated French and British regiments, but as one cohesive fighting force under a single command and deployed into a single region. There's a sense of assurance in his words, or anticipation, that the AEF will soon be victorious in the fight against Germany. When the majority of the AEF arrived overseas in August of 1918, they quickly set about dealing the Germans a series of catastrophic defeats, collectively became known as the Hundred Days Offensive. Kenneth's August 1st letter is dated just one week before the start of the Hundred Days Offensive, that is, the final few months of World War I. This sudden blitz collapsed German lines and pushed their forces back to the Hindenburg Line, a series of fortifications built along the Franco-German border south of Belgium. August 17, 1918. Somewhere near the front lines. Well, dearest, I must turn in. You know, dear, it seems funny to go to bed so near the front with guns booming away. They seemed so far away about two months ago. Two nights ago, the Bosch dropped seven bombs about 300 yards from where I am. Great stuff, but I don't feel the least bit excited. Seven bombs dropped 300 yards away. That's the equivalent of two and a half to three football fields in length. Artillery guns and their crews were generally located some distance from the front lines and provided a relatively safe position, threatened only by longer-range enemy artillery or bombs dropped from primitive fighting aircraft. 
The war is a much more immediate reality for him than it was when he wrote of the exciting game of it all just two months before, in June, when he was still at sea. The war doesn't seem so exciting after all. August 21st, 1918. Dearest girl of mine, I'm writing this dear up at our headquarters, which is in an old chateau. Of course, the place is run down, but one can see at one time it was some place. Deep gardens, thick patches of woods, springs here and there, flowers, statues, silvered falls, fine stables, winding walls, I think gives an idea of what's around it. The imagery here is quite pastoral and romantic. A pretty chateau in the French countryside probably isn't what we'd first think of when picturing a war zone, but this imagery provides a bit of respite from the gunfire and shelling of the previous letter. Artillerymen were often housed in broken villages and towns, a posting which afforded them not only safety, but a modicum of comfort. The presence of armies and warfare here comes across as an intrusion on this otherwise picturesque environment. While life in the trenches was hell on earth, the life of an artilleryman was more normal than would be expected from a soldier in an overseas conflict. August 27, 1918, somewhere in France. My dear, dear sweetheart, it's one that I never will regret, no matter what may be the outcome, for I at least gave it for one and only cause at this time. Little did I think at that time, although I realized the possibility of what and where I would be one year from then. Here I sit, in a little room, just across from me, on a table and facing me, is the picture of the one person in all the world who I wish for and I'm waiting for because I love her so much. She's a darling. Alongside of me is a trusty 45, loaded to the brim, him for Bosch. Of course, I have a great deal of censoring to do. It gives me an opportunity to find just what the mental condition of the men in the company is. It is fine, and great spirit and cheerfulness is shown by all of them. These contrasting images of Harriet's picture and Kenneth's gun express tension between Kenneth's duty as a soldier and his desire to go home and see his loved ones again, a tension woven into so many of his letters to Harriet. His mention of censorship adds another facet to this tension. The U.S. practiced postal censorship during World War I to prevent espionage, authorized under federal laws. Kenneth, as one of the men who handled postal censoring, was undoubtedly aware of the fact that his letters home were being read with a critical eye by others. Think about his letters so far, what he says and how, and also what he doesn't say. How he insists he and the other men on the front lines are fine and happy, and how he repeats in his letters that there's so much he can't say. September 22nd, 1918. Darlingest girl of mine, it has been three, four, no, I think five days since I last wrote you, but they have not been days for me, as I have been up 60 hours at a stretch and never so busy, work all the time. I feel fine and in the best of spirits through it all. We've moved again, quite a ways, and I have seen great things. The other night, while out on a long ride after lost trucks, I visited that wonderful city of Verdun. I saw it by bright moonlight and marveled. Once again, Kenneth's letter understates the seriousness of his experiences. Going 60 hours or more without sleep takes a huge toll on the body, including emotions and cognitive function. Yet he insists he's fine. And that wonderful city he mentions? Two years prior, it was the site of a bloody and devastating battle with high casualties on both sides. The Battle of Verdun, famed for its massive casualty counts of seven to 800,000, including 400,000 dead, raged for nearly a year in 1916-1917 and shattered the landscape on which it was fought. Since Verdun in 1917, the German forces had slowly fought their way forward through the beleaguered French and British soldiers, taking northeastern France inch by bloody inch into its sphere. This momentum quickly shifted with the arrival of not only British troops fresh from the recently concluded Sinai campaign in the East, but also the horde of energetic young Americans of the AEF. The unspoken details in his letter continue to present a glaring tonal contrast between the reality of World War I and how he writes home about it. September 29, 1918. 
Dearest sweetheart, girl of mine, at daybreak I poked around in dugouts, trenches, and had a lot of fun. The enclosed letter is one I found. Translate it and save it for me, dear. I also got a handy little German shovel for our garden and a leather belt pouch. September 29th, just three days after the start of the Meuse-Argonne Offensive, the final stage of combat in World War I. This offensive is the single largest and deadliest battle in American history, with 1.2 million soldiers participating and nearly 350,000 dead and wounded during the 47-day campaign. Here he mentions the fun of looting enemy trenches without mentioning the brutality of trench warfare itself, speaking only of the items he's taken for himself and Harriet. A letter, a belt pouch, perhaps most starkly, Kenneth retrieves a handy little German shovel for our garden, combining images of brutal war and romantic domesticity akin to his earlier description of the chateau serving as a military HQ. An earlier letter dated from this week puts Kenneth's location in the Meuse, somewhere around the rural commune of Verry. Beginning at dawn on September 26, 1918, the American guns opened up, flinging roughly a million dollars a minute worth of ammunition at the German lines. In three hours, the guns fired more ammunition than had been used by all artillery on both sides during the entire four-year American Civil War, at a cost of approximately $3.5 billion in 2022 currency. October 10th, 1918. Most dear girl of mine, I talked with three German prisoners last night on the road for a minute, and they all said, Deutschland kaputt. On October 10th, we're now one month away from the armistice that will end the fighting in Europe. This is the first time Kenneth mentions interacting with enemy soldiers, here in the context of having captured war prisoners. Battles were mostly regimented affairs, with artillery bombardments preceding charges as soldiers surged over the top to try and overrun opposing trenches. Attacks would be ordered a few times a day, starting at dawn and going till dusk, with lulls in between to claim bodies, evacuate wounded, and marshal prisoners of war. The letter doesn't indicate the tone of the German soldiers' words. Were they angry, resigned, or something else? We'll never know, but from their words, Deutschland kaputt, Germany is broken, Germany is destroyed. Perhaps they were anticipating the end that was to come, however they felt about it. October 15th, 1918. Dearest girl, it seems at times that I just must really and truly talk with you, just to sort of relieve all that I have to say. I guess, dear, I needn't tell you how fierce it is to be so much in love with someone and not be able to be near that someone. I was thinking a little while back how wonderfully crisp it would be, dearest girl, if I should get back home sometime next summer. Then we could be married, and for our honeymoon, or at least part of it, spend two or three weeks, or just as long as possible, in that little cottage up at the harbor. Darling, can you imagine what a happy man I'll be when I have you, a little home of our own, and a future full of happiness? These things seem so big over here. Enclosed, dearest, is a button of a German uniform. Private. The crown is prominent in all their equipment. With combat surely ramping up, Kenneth takes a moment to describe a fantasy of returning home to marry Harriet. He hints at an anxiety attached to his experiences with his repetition, again, of needing to speak with Harriet about what he's going through but being unable to do so until he's home. Certainly, this thought of their happy future together helped him cope to some degree. But for the moment, this thought, this fantasy, is just that. War intrudes once again, and we crash back into the present reality with Kenneth's mention of a new item he's taken from the battlefield. This time, it's a button from a German soldier's uniform. October marked the second phase of the offensive, one which went slightly better for the now battle-tested AEF. Despite the high casualty counts of every battle in the war, the massive weight of nearly two million additional soldiers inexorably drove the German lines back through Belgium and towards the former German border. October 22nd, 1918. Most darling sweetheart, as I write this, dear, Bosch shells are landing about a kilo from here, and an American battery is responding so close here that it shakes this paper as I write you, and that noise is sure music. There's an air battle going on overhead now. 
but they are common now. I just sort of give it a casual glance. Funny how things grow old. That is all but one, and that is my love for you, sweetheart. It never will. So many things fill me with interest. Pictures that I see here, I'll never forget. I'll bring them all back to you, darling, and tell you of them. I can hardly wait for that time. P.S. Today at our French dinner party, I drank a toast to the Allies. Only red wine, but it was the most I'd ever put away. It tasted like sour grapes, but I acted natural. We've arrived at Kenneth's last letter before the final weeks of the Meuse Argonne Offensive, and the combat continues to escalate. After hundreds of thousands of lives and hundreds of millions of artillery shells, the brutal back and forth in the Argonne Forest finally reached a turning point from which Allied victory was not just a hope, but an achievable goal. That exciting game he spoke of just a few months ago is totally gone now, as he's surrounded by shelling and air battles, seeing so much combat in such a short time. It is important to note that it was not solely the American presence that won the offensive, with their large numbers compensating for a relatively untrained and untested fighting force, but that French and British tactical victories changed the landscape of the battlefield and allowed the Americans the space to bring their fresher numbers to bear against the depleted and demoralized enemy. It's grown old to him, he writes, and once more he reiterates how much he loves Harriet and wishes to tell her everything once he's home. World War I began as a conflict of empires and ended in bloody victory for the Allies. Often considered the first modern conflict, World War I was marked by barbarism, death, and the shattering of the pre-existing world order. 